The purpose of this video is to help you understand how to prepare for cross-examination for a mock trial. Um, so in cross-examination, you are going to be questioning the witnesses that are called by the other side, and they will have gone through a direct examination. Um, and after they do that, after they get the chance to tell their story in their own words in response to very open-ended questions, your side gets a chance to cross-examine them and try to elicit responses from this witness that support your theory of the case. So we're going to talk about how to do that today. So cross-examination, um, we're going to think about it as a five-step process to prepare for cross-examination. And the first step that we're going to talk about is to review the indictment and make sure you are clear on what you need to accomplish in cross-examination. So what is it that you need your witness to say to help you prove what you ultimately want to prove? Um, this is a mistake that a lot of people make is they just jump right into writing the questions, but you really have to get into the elements of the case and what is it that um, you're ultimately trying to accomplish in the trial. You got to keep that really at the forefront as you prepare for cross. So um, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to use the example of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Um, in the case of State of Oregon versus Goldilocks, um, she's being charged with theft, criminal mischief, and criminal trespass. So if you're not familiar with this story, um, I recommend that you Google that really quick so that you have an idea of what we're talking about here. <laughs> But um, you can see here that this is the first part of the indictment where it's listing um, exactly what she's being charged with. And then later in the indictment, it's going to go into the details a little more specifically of what each of those counts means. So we see here that she is accused of having unlawfully and knowingly committed theft. Um, unlawfully and intentionally damaging property and having no reasonable ground to believe that she had a right to do so and then unlawfully and, un and knowingly entered their house. Um, so this is what she's being charged with and um, what I want to do is you know if I am a an attorney for the prosecution um, I, I have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that these counts align with what the defendant did and why they did it. So I really, I have to prove those things true of her actions and her intentions. And if I'm an attorney for the defense, I have to create doubt about whether or not she really did those things or that she had criminal intent um, or that she's not criminally responsible for one reason or another, okay? So once I'm really clear on what it is that I'm trying to prove, um, I can move to the second step of cross-examination, which is now I want to go to the affidavit, which is the witness statement of the witness that I'll be cross-examining. And I need to know that document super well. Um, I need to understand what the strengths of the witness are. What is it about them that it is going to play well with the jury? going to make them seem believable, like they're telling the truth, all that stuff. And what about their affidavit shows some weaknesses that I could potentially exploit in cross-examination, okay? Um, obviously, as I'm preparing for cross, I'm focusing specifically on the weaknesses. So here I have a... Um, a, an affidavit for Papa Bear in this case and you can see that at the top of the affidavit I've created a little marking key for myself here. I have strengths, what's believable about the person or establishes important facts and I also have weaknesses, um, not believable, seems unsure, shows a bias, maybe remembers incorrectly, all that kind of stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the affidavit and I'm going to mark the affidavit for strengths and weaknesses. So as I was reading, the first thing that kind of stuck out to me is he says, my family and I were sitting down to a nice breakfast of porridge. The porridge was too hot, so we decided to go for a walk and let it cool down. I left first and then mama and baby bear followed. 
Um, so I marked this as a strength because what it tells me is that Papa Bear is a loving family man and they have a nice family routine of breakfast and maybe a morning stroll through the woods. Um, and I think the jury is going to like that. So I highlighted that as a strength of his. Okay, as we keep reading, he says the weather became very cold and snowy suddenly, so we had to cut our walk short. Um, okay, I highlighted this as a weakness because, and you know, honestly, it's not even maybe so much a weakness, but it is something that I can use and cross. So I highlighted it. You can see up here that Papa Bear is a witness for the prosecution. That means if I'm cross-examining Papa Bear, then I am an attorney for the defense, and I'm trying to create reasonable doubt about Goldilocks' guilt according to those counts, right? So I see this as something that I can use to help me create doubt about her guilt. Um, the storm was really severe, and even though they're a family of bears, uh, in theory accustomed to living in the outdoors, lots of warm fur, um, they felt that they were endangered by the storm and needed to return home to shelter to weather the storm. So, you know, if I return to my indictment, one of the counts says that the defendant did unlawfully enter their house, but I'm what I'm thinking here is that I'm going to try to prove that Goldilocks entered the house out of necessity. It's a necessity defense um, to preserve her own life. Like if she hadn't broken and entered into the house, she may have lost her own life or sustained a serious injury due to the storm. Um, and if I can get Papa Bear to acknowledge that the storm was in fact that severe, that's going to help me kind of build that case for necessity for Goldilocks, right? So I'm going to highlight that as something I want to tackle and cross for sure. Moving on, he says, when we returned to our house, we found the door slightly ajar. We were so hungry from our walk that we didn't investigate why the door was open. Okay, now um, I also highlighted that as something I might want to address and cross because it seems a little reckless to me. Like if you come home and your door is open, um, that might be suspicious to you and something that you want to investigate, but he didn't do that. So, you know, if the prosecution is trying to paint him as this upstanding, loving, careful father, um, I might bring this up in cross to show that not all of his actions that day totally made sense. And remember, he's not the one on trial, but, you know, it might, it could still help me in cross if I can establish those things. Okay, so I've got some things in the affidavit marked that I could tackle in cross. Moving on to step three, now it's time to write some questions. Um, for cross-examination, you can only write questions that are leading. What this means is that the questions can be answered with a simple yes or a simple no. And the reason that you use these questions in cross is because your goal is to maintain control of the witness. If we give Papa Bear a lot of time to go on and on and on, to justify himself why he didn't check the door, to explain uh, why he didn't feel the storm was a threat but it was necessary to return home anyway, blah, 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 that gives the jury time to sympathize with his account. And we don't want to give them that. We want simple yes or no questions that fit our narrative of what's going on here. So we're going to keep our questions very straightforward and leading. Um, and, you know, you want to make sure that your questions build to prove what you want to prove. You don't want to include too many things in a single question. Have a series of questions um, that build to that item that you want to prove. So. Let me give you an example of a line of questioning for Papa Bear. Uh, Papa Bear, you and your family returned from your walk earlier than anticipated, is that correct? And he's, he's going to have to answer yes. And this was due to a strong storm that had developed, correct? Yes. 
And if you had remained out in the storm, that would have been very uncomfortable and perhaps even dangerous for your family, correct? Yes. Okay, so I'm through this line of questioning, I'm kind of forcing him to acknowledge that the storm was a dangerous situation. And that's going to help me with my necessity defense for Goldilocks, right? Because she would have found herself facing the same kind of decision and alternatives. Okay. Um, the fourth step here is to make sure your questions include notes about the location of the answers in the affidavit in case you need to impeach. So let's talk about what that means. So we built this questioning based off of something that he said in his affidavit, right? It was um, paragraph two, lines one and two, where he talked about the weather becoming cold and snowy and having to cut the walk short. So what I want to make sure that I do when I write my questions for crosses, I want to make sure that I have indicated where that information is in the affidavit. Because if Papa Bear tries to say no, when that would be contradicting the affidavit, um, I want to monopolize on that because that is not fully truthful on behalf of that witness, right? So let's look at how this might play out. Like if I asked Papa Bear, you and your family returned from your walk earlier than anticipated, is that correct? And if he says no, Okay, the first thing that I would do in questioning is I would say, I would paraphrase what he said, just to make sure. Um, so you're saying that you did not return from your walk earlier than you expected to? Okay, get confirmation that that's truly what they're saying. Okay, and if he again says no, that's when I'm gonna pull out the affidavit and I'm gonna say, please read paragraph two, lines one and two. Um, do you recall giving this statement? And then Papa Bear is going to say, well, I don't know what he's going to say because he has contradictory statements now, but it's not going to be helpful to the prosecution here because it's going to look like um, maybe he doesn't remember, maybe he's not honest, okay? I don't know. It's not going to be helpful though. So I want to make sure that as a cross-examiner, I'm prepared with those citations in case I need them. Okay. All right, the fifth and final step is you want to make sure that you are looking through that witness statement for objectionable material and preparing some notes to direct to object if it is raised during the direct examination. So um, while the witness that you are going to cross-examine is being direct examined, um, you want to be listening with a really critical ear to make sure that that wit that attorney is not questioning the witness about things they're not allowed to question them about, okay? And if they are, you can object, something like hearsay, speculation, um, op opinion on the ultimate issue, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that might help parts of that witness's testimony be stricken from the record. So that's also a part of your role as the cross-examiner of the witness, is to be really vigilant during the direct examination um, and try to help advance your narrative um, in that way as well. Okay, so these are the five steps um, for preparing for cross-examination. Um, if you, you know, go through these steps and you're thorough in your understanding of your goals in the case and um, the format of cross-examination questions, then you should be really successful in getting what you need out of these witnesses.